All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Behind the Human. I'm your host, Mark Champagne, and it's my job to unpack the stories and mental fitness practices of people living at the top of their game personally and professionally. As a sports and performance psychologist, Dr. Michael Gervais is one of the world's leading experts on the relationship between the mind and elite performance. Can't wait to jam with you, brother. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thank you for including me in your community. Oh, of course, this is this is going to be good. I mean, the research, like I said before we hit record, uh, I've listened to you several times on on uh, I think mutual mutual contacts, Rich Roll's show, and and many more. Um, but then when I really started to do the research, I'm like, holy smokes! I mean, there's so many overlaps with people in the book and 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 the podcast that it's just going to flow naturally. So I'm excited. And we're going to start off, though, with uh, just avoid, because I've got a, a bigger bio for, for you in the show notes, and people can understand exactly what your work is. Um, but I'd like to know who you are. You know, who's, who's Mike, the, the guy today uh, who, who sits in front of us? It's one of the ancient questions, isn't it? Who am yeah, I? And exactly. so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to start there. I've spent a lot of time exploring how to answer that and maybe even more importantly, how to live in alignment with that answer. And so um, I will I will tell you who I am through an arc rather sure. than just give you the words that matter Love most it. to me. And I'll, I'm happy to do that as well. But, you know, the arc is I grew up in a small farm and it was remote it was dirt roads. Um, it was not a luxury high end farm. Like this was a, um, just a real escape. farm. <laughs> yeah. It was an escape for my parents to get out of the city and kind of yeah. do the hippie thing. And they pretty much dropped out. They created a, uh, by accident, a laissez faire parenting approach, which was, mm -hmm. Hey, let mother nature teach you and we'll give you some guideposts, but we're really just gonna, you know, sort it out. You, you, you need to figure it out. Okay. And so that served me in some respects, great, you know, and, and, and wonderful. And in other respects, there's been some challenges to that. And so, uh, at some point my dad decided to get a corporate job and move to California. And then I found myself, um, not interested in tradi traditional stick and ball sport. And it was the traditional stick and ball sport, which was a bunch of man raid rules, if you will. And then adults screaming at kids. And I thought, well, this doesn't seem right. This is not how it worked, you know, in the wild. And when I say the wild, the farm had right behind our house had like 23 acres. And okay. if it was dark out and you didn't know how to get home, and this is like at age nine, if you didn't yeah. know how to get home, like it was really scary. So you learn to figure out some signals early um, because it was dangerous and it was scary. And so then I, I moved into traditional or away from traditional stick and ball. This is like in the um, for 13, 12, 13 year olds, you know, kind of punk kid, if you will. Yeah. And I found myself in action sports. Okay. So it's, um, motocross, BMX, um, surfing, skateboarding, and it was all environments where mother nature for the most part was the teacher, because mm -hmm. if you hesitated or if you didn't estimate correctly your skill versus the, the, the risk that you'd leave some blood on the asphalt, you'd be held underwater, like you were drowning, you know, like there was real consequences. So what ended up taking place for me in that environment is that I couldn't translate that core part of the relationship between mother nature teaching, and then translate that over into performance environments, where there was, again, back to the human made rules and judges and critiques. And mm -hmm. so it set me down this path, because I knew I could do the thing, but then as soon as there was judges and, 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 you know, people on the beach, this was surfing was uh, where this came alive for me. I was a shelved version of myself Okay. And as a 15 year old kid. I knew my skill didn't change from yesterday and I could do the thing yesterday, but what was going on? Well, it was my mind. And looking back, it's quite easy to see that, but it led me down this path to understand how do you optimize your mind? Mm -hmm. And so I actually went counter to the culture that I appreciated, which was learning mother nature, swift consequences, harsh rules, um, to formal education, which was like, it was like the place that I needed to get my arms around 
how the mind works. So undergrad psych, master's degree in sports science, and then a PhD in psychology, licensed as a psychologist, okay. and then um, a specialization in environments of consequence. Was that all, like, as you were arcing through that journey, were there points where your parents were like, whoa, because you were coming from a very different upbringing of, to your point, like, let's learn from nature and so forth. Uh, the last thing you're doing is is going into this, this higher education set up, like, was there any friction there or, or you were just following your path? You know, my, my dad had his gaze somewhere else. So it okay. was not on what I was doing. And okay. so my mom, um, and I love my parents, this is going to sound harsh, but I love my parents. Um, my mom was more interested in the household presenting a certain way. Sure. And so yeah. it was only a real concern. It was like, wow, Mike, that's interesting that you're doing that, but no, 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 nothing underneath of it. And then when, like when I would get ex like in high school, you know, there was plenty of opportunities where I had, I was sent home, you know, and yeah. it was like, well, I don't know what, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, Mike, like you got to figure it out. So it wasn't like, <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, I'm 16 years old. I'm going to go surfing. Thank yeah. God the teacher sent me home and, you know, and I got expelled today. Like, I'm just going to go surfing. And they're like, yeah, okay. So no, they, it was, sure. that, that's laissez-faire, if you will. It's yeah. a nice way of saying it. I mean, the other thing that, that comes up for me hearing your, your backstory was that somewhere in the, in the, in the prep for this interview, I saw that your mission is to help people live the present moment. And I wonder, I mean, if I think of waves crashing over my head and, you know, being dragged down to the bottom of the ocean floor or to your point, you know, on 23 acres of, of dark farmland. I mean, you're in the height of the present moment. You, you have no choice other, uh, other to, other than to, to be there. So do, have you, is that where that comes from? Do you think? Yes. And then I'll, I'll add an insight here is that the present moment is the keyhole to be able to unlock the potential that lies dormant in you yeah. in me. And the reason I say it's the, it's the keyhole here is because the present moment is where high performance, if you're interested in that, it's yeah. where it's expressed. It's also where wisdom is revealed. And it's, it's where all things that are true and beautiful and amazing are experienced. Yeah. And I agree. so if you want, if you're interested in any three of those <laughs> high performance, deep, purpose, meaning, wisdom, insight, and or experiencing the riches of the present moment, you have to understand how to be in it. And danger and risk will force you into it. Sure. And our, your ancestry and my ancestry, they figured that out because they passed on enough survival mechanisms for us to be here. So danger and risk will force you in it. However, we don't live in normally very dangerous environments you know in in the century that we're living in it's relatively sterile mm -hmm. and i say that in context embracing what's happening internationally uh the wars that are, are taking place so i say that v from a very western um perspective sure and i also have uh deep compassion awareness for people who have experienced physical trauma so i'm there's an asterisk next to that However, most of us live relatively complicated, boring, safe lives. And, and yeah. you say, oh, God, wh where is he going? Um, my experience has been working with, uh, I mean, I don't know how to say this without uh, sounding like from the pulpit, but they are the best in the world at what they do across multiple disciplines. And they are fundamentally which is an important word, organizing their life to get better, to grow, to yeah. push on the limit. And when you fundamentally organize your life that way, risk is part of every day's experience. Getting up on the edge where it feels as though you have to think or move faster than you're capable of, it lights up our internal experience. Yeah. We love it. We're well primed for it but not skilled for it for the modern world. So we've got that ancient brain and modern challenges. Mm -hmm. And if we don't fundamentally organize mm -hmm. our life towards our potential, the brain will win. Yeah. And the brain, every time. Yeah. yeah. The brain is designed for 
survival, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Hey, play it safe. Do not go on the ledge. That's where people die. Stay away from the frontier, but it's where the, it's on the frontier. It's above the, the tree line where we get to understand like what, what we truly are capable of. Yeah. And so I hope that that's as concrete as I can make. Like there's so much more inside of us and there are ways to unlock it. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Well, that's what I, I definitely want to ask you about that because when you're, you're mentioning just kind of reaching those, those extreme moments, uh, I couldn't help but think uh, of a past guest, Stephen Kotler, uh, working at the Flow uh, Flow Research Collective, and talking about flow states, obviously, which you you naturally, I think, jump into a flow state in these extreme environments, right? Um, or I I, sh- I should say, I guess, when you're doing something that you know really lights you up for a certain period of time, and you you know time stops and so forth. But what about just the fact that the majority of us are either living in the past or living in the future and almost numbed out to the present moment, you know, well, like the, how do we get there? Yeah. So what's, what's dangerous about staying and you don't really stay. So I use that word loosely here in the present moment. Actually, let me just, let me pull that open for just a moment is that this moment happens and then this moment happens and this moment. So what we're, we're trying to stay on time with the mm-hmm. present moment. And when we link or hook or fully hydrate moment one with moment two with moment three, then we start to find flow state. Okay. Yeah. So it's the linking and hooking of the moments together. And again, risk can do that, but that's not the only way that it takes place. But to to your to the point that we're making here is that um actually I lost my train of thought when I was opening up how the present moment works. Like, what what, what was the STEM question? I'm so well, sorry. Just, yeah, no, just the, what are the other ways to get into, to, to be more conscious of the present moment and pause, I guess, so we're, because so many people are numbed out uh, and That's we're on autopilot, used. right? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're on autopilot. Okay. The present moment and having the courage to be vulnerable to the unfolding unpredictable next moment. So there's incredible trust and courage and vulnerability that's that's interlinked to be able to eyes wide open explore what is going to present in the present the next present moment. Yeah. And when we are overwhelmed, anxious, tired, fatigued, irritated, who's got the resources to do that? You know, like screw it, like I uh I need to solve what's coming next, so I'm going to try to get ahead of it. And there's a, re- there's a purpose to use your mind to think forward, you know, and that's why, where we do planning and um, thinking deeply about uh, our future and whatever, like there's a purpose for it. However, when we are feeling overwhelmed, we cannot tolerate the anxiousness that comes with trusting how yeah. the next moment will unfold. So that's why we need training to be able to do that. And we don't need high risk only environments to do it. High risk is almost like a forcing function for it because if you don't get it right, you get injured or you die, you know, or somebody else yeah. does, which is brutal in in many of the environments that we work with. The, but the mundane can also allow you to practice it. And that's where meditation, mindfulness, um, you know, walking meditations, eating meditations, sitting meditations, all of those um, are a safer environment at the outset. But then once you get into it, it can be wildly um, emotionally risky as well. Yeah. Well, but I, I'm glad you mentioned just, you know, it doesn't have to be this incredibly complicated set of, of systems and trainings. I, I think of a mutual guest that we've had, Apollo Ono, and I remember him just really, you know, causing me to kind of step back in reflection when I was waiting for this Olympic level, like mental priming system. And he came out, he's like, I have post-its in the, in the areas of my house that I most frequent reminded me of my intention that day or the goals that I'm, I'm working towards just as these subtle reminders to continually, you know, reprime my mind. And I feel like that, you know, that, that comes up. If I think of any of the elite athletes that have been on the show, like these, these simple little practices, but it's the consistency. Well, that's why I start with the first principle of we miss this insight 
what you're talking about and what I'm going to add to it, we miss it when we look at these extraordinary athletes and we watch them reach a podium or whatever the celebration moment is. And we think that they're freaks, they're different, they're mm. genetically whatever. Yes, and the, the big takeaway is that they have fundamentally organized their life to get better. And so yeah. when that, there's, there's no shortcuts and hacks, there's no tricks, tips, secrets, you know. So what Apollo shared with you is the outspring of like, when there's a fundamental commitment, let's say you make a fundamental commitment to your, your romantic partner, your spouse. Yeah. And, th and it's that, that important and that big, and you've made it public in front of your, your community, the, the vows, if you will, you don't need to write a post-it mm -hmm. to say that I'm going to honor my vow today. You've made a fundamental commitment and you orientate your life towards that. And so if a there's example. an aspect of it that you want to get better at, so I'm going to support Apollo here, his insight, when there's an aspect that you really want to upskill and up level, if you've made that fundamental commitment, then it's a natural extension to say, oh, I want to get great at this part of it. So I'm going to put, what can I do? I don't know. Let me put a post-it on, on my refrigerator. Yeah. It sounds so simple, but if you miss that first part, it's just a post-it and it doesn't have the weight required to hold up under stress. Mm. And so that's why affirmations are weak. I'm sorry if you yeah. like affirmations, like, you know, they're just, they're, they're just, they, ha they don't have the weight to them. So yeah. first principles is where um, there's deep weight. And that's yeah. what we want to be able to anchor to first. Well, and there's this aspect, I wanted to ask you about this, just the, because I see this all the time with, it, whether we're working with organizations or even individually with people, where so for me, it's all about questions and some of the mental fitness routines and whatnot that can help people slow down and ask these questions or surface them, I should say. But most of the time, I'm being asked, well, what are the questions to just expand my thinking or to ideate to the next level? And sure, you know, here's a whole list of questions. But before spending some time trying to clear out some mental pollution and getting clear, I mean, it's you're getting half of the the, the potential of those prompts. And it's something I've, see, I, I've seen over and over come up with uh, with your work of of just this idea of clarity and some prompts and principles, and I guess first principles, essentially. So I'm just curious, like how, when you start working with the, whether it's a, an NFL team or, or Microsoft or whoever, like where do you start with these, these individuals and teams? Well, you meet them where they are. You sure. Know, in sport, you meet somebody where they sweat and you understand what it's like to be them. Mm -hmm. And then you work to understand, and this is not necessarily easily scalable, Right. There's some Fair. tech that can, that can hopefully come online to help us with this, but you meet them where they sweat, you meet them where they are uh, emotionally and mentally, and you work to understand what their assets are, how they solve problems, how they think about the world, how they think about themselves, the clarity there or lack of, and then you know, work to understand what are the, what are they trying to solve? And then, so you understand that. And then the next thing is you, you, you work to get uncommonly clear about two things and call this, a, we call this a vision, but it's, it, that word doesn't quite capture it, but like really what is the image of who you are wanting to become more consistently hmm. and what is it that you want to be doing? And so yeah. if you can put those two together, cast it three years, five years, seven years down the road, whatever it might be, and then uncommonly so be clear about what that is so much so that when you share it with, with, when they're sharing it with me, or I'm trying to understand it with them, that we understand the fabric and the fibers inside of the fabric. And then we can both nod our heads to it and go, okay, is this it? No, oh, that's not it. Is, is it like this? Yes. And you okay. get to that point and then you play it back and there's a consistency in the, in the shared image. Then you can start building a plan, mm. you know, back from that. And so and then I'll just add this last thing is, yeah, yeah. is whether it's working with one, one athlete, one executive, or an entire organization is that you, you go, okay, that's, I get it. And I'm going to help you be accountable to what the work we just did and not accountable, like watching you, 
but the spirit of like, oh, this is exciting to go on that adventure with you. And like, okay, I'm going to partner up with you. And that's, that's the essence of it. Sounds amazing. Hello, everyone. I first wanted to say thanks for being here, and I hope you're enjoying the show. I wanted to let you know if you're interested, I just launched the Better Questions newsletter designed to provide you with a consistent 15-minute opportunity to pause and think because a pause leads to clarity and operating with intention where we all win and thrive. The newsletter is short, simple, and practical, providing you with three quality reflective prompts and mental fitness twice a month. But as always, I'll adjust the frequency based on your feedback. Never forget, at any point, you are always one question away from a completely different life or outcome. You can sign up over at BehindTheHuman.com, which will also give you a free preview of my debut book, Personal Socrates. BehindTheHuman.com. Now back to the show. I love the language around just this uncommonly clear. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm curious for, for people listening at home, if they wanted to, to take a pause and do a little bit of journaling to try to get to that, at least a starting point on their own. Like what, when you say uncommonly clear, is that is that just really nuances on the language? You know, like how, how, do, how would someone go about doing that, right? It's like writing it out and then rewriting and coming back to it or a- any tips? Yes. Yeah, no, no tips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <some> insights, so, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, one is when we write something or draw something, you know, and we're moving it from our imagination to a concrete form. Oftentimes, there's a loss in that translation, and so mm-hmm. sometimes I listen. I'm listening often to this phrase um, from a great musician, Cat Stevens, that says, "I listen to my words, and they fall far below." Okay. So the first order of work is to feel it and see it true to yourself. And that takes time. Our imagination is one of the great unique, um, human capabilities that Mm -hmm. we don't think others have. And we are not skilled at it in a way that, um, promotes us and facilitates us to be working towards our upper capabilities. So this is, you know, you hear it in sport all the time, visualization, mental imagery, and it really is using the power of your mind to create a feel and, and images of the future that you would like to, uh, how you'd like to experience the future. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I've got this narrative in my head, like it's always there, which is like, this ain't the secret now. This is not like yeah, yeah, yeah. they will become. This is the work to be uncommonly clear about yeah. who you want to be, how you want to be engaged in in the activities that you want to be doing, and it's likely that the activities will change. But if you're clear about who you want to be and how you want to do what you're doing, then you can fill that in in any activity that unfolds in the future. So the seeing the activity itself is not material. It's mm-hmm. who and how you want to be. And then the other, to your point, if you can get it out either verbally or on in form, meaning written, then that is an extraction of the first experience. And, and that is so that you can communicate it and or get it out of an, a looping that takes place. Okay. And let me explain the looping. Yeah. Is when, you know, when you, your head hits the pillow at night and you're like, oh, I'm tired. Okay, let's go. Great. I'm ready for bed. And then your head hits the pillow and you start thinking and ruminating. And then you go, oh yeah, that's going to be great. I want to remember that tomorrow. And then you think about it again to try to anchor it. And you think about it again to try to make sure you don't forget it. And before you know it, you're like, oh my God, what am I doing? So that that's what I'm talking about, this looping. That's just a small thin slice of what happens. And when you get it out and you make the invisible visible, no, it's an extraction. It's going to lose a little bit of the essence of it, but it, it you're memorializing it so that you can have a starting place to share it with somebody else. Yeah, it's powerful. It's so powerful. Yeah, <laughs> um, I love it. There's so many. I mean, there's just so many angles we can we could continue the conversation around. I, I would. I, I almost want to back it up a little bit and just you shared obviously a lot of the, some of the work that you're doing with with people, but I would just love to know what in your opinion, like what is a sports psychologist in 2022? 
you just ground the conversation there. It, it takes on quite a bit of forms. You know, there, it depends on where your training, your interest lies, and the partner that you're working with, whether it's a large, fast, high pressured, high stakes environment, or yeah. it is more artistic, creative, you know, it, it, it depends. So sure. what, so I, I have spent 20, 25 years in high pressured, you know, big sport. And for the last 10 years, I've been deeply interested in taking those best practices into business. Okay. And the reason I'm so interested in that is because most people are working inside of a business and we have the model in modern business has been the extraction of the worker model. Give me everything you have. I'll mm -hmm. pay you a little bit better if you even work longer, but give me everything you have. Yeah. Yeah. You should know your family, you know, like we'll give you a couple of vacations here and there, but give me every. And so look at the great, um, resignation that's taking place right yeah. now. What's happening is people are waving their arms and they're saying, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not yeah. working this way anymore. Yeah. So modern work and modern leaders that are going to lead and unlock for human potential are going to understand how to unlock within the settings of the work environment, the psychology that allows people to see them, their whole selves in meaningful work, mm -hmm. to understand the psychology of agility and not just say like, you know what we used to say 20 some years ago to kids, I was one of those kids. Um, okay. Be confident. Yeah. I was like, well, okay. Yeah. Good. How? They just go out there, be confident. You, you can do it. But that's not what, like I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like, Hey, go focus. Yeah. 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 Uh, on what? Well, focus on the ball. But not always on the ball. Sometimes you got to know where the where the where the goal is, and sometimes you got to know where the other focus on what, like how. Um, just focus. So listen. Yeah. Confidence so is true. a trainable skill. Being calm is a trainable skill. Anything you train, you can get better at. Deep focus is a trainable skill. Dynamic fo focus is a trainable skill. Self trust is a trainable skill. Optimism is a trainable skill. Like I can go on and on and on. That's mm -hmm. what we do with athletes. That's what we're also now doing with uh, executive leaders to help them understand how to unlock their potential and then do it at scale um, with their team of twelve that they're leading or the team of you know at Microsoft. It's essentially one hundred eighty thousand people that sure um, we're working with. So for then for for organizations that are on the cusp, let's just say that under, let's just, I'll, I'll make some assumptions here, but just to paint a picture, but that are coming out of the, okay, we're going to, we're going to help our team, uh, with their well being and so forth. And five years ago, let's say five, 10 years ago, this would have been like, oh, you're going to have slides and we're going to increase productivity and lower turnover. Like those were kind of some of the, the buzzwords. I feel like we're starting to move away from that a little bit, which is good. But for teams that are not all the way there, like how do you, what's your angle, your narrative to come in to, to I guess almost uh, sell the, 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 the reason why we should be focusing on, on this work okay. more, uh, yeah, right? cool. more holistically? Yeah, it, it, it. I think you know the answer. It's it, but let's 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 wrestle with it. The Great Resignation is the reason that it's forcing companies because when you ask the people that are leaving, that they're saying, you know, do, do you have a job that you're going to? I'm like, no, I'm just not, this is <laughs> whack. Like, I don't know who you think. Like, I don't have to do this anymore. And like, this is this is awful. And so. Working environments, I don't want to use the word even workforce because it sounds so um, inhuman. Yeah. But but the the ecosystem, the complicated ecosystem to do something meaningful in the world is multidimensional and humans are multidimensional and they're a significant part of whatever shared mission that the company is setting forth on. And so if your people are tired, you're going to struggle. The mm -hmm. company will struggle if they're fatigued, if they're anxious, if they're irritable, if they don't like being great teammates, the, the, the mission, you know, will not be realized. 
And so the, the easiest narrative is there's only three things that we can train as humans. We can train our craft, the technical skills to be great at something. We can train our body, which is the carriage that's required, you know, uh, to operate well. And then we can train our mind. Yeah. And the best in the world are not leaving one of those up to chance. So let's learn from how the best do it. Fold those simple practices in um, to environments that want to be great, ecosystems and businesses that want to be great. And I would use, I just want to raise an, uh, uh, an antenna for well-being. Sure. And so there was an over, so there was the extraction model and then people were like, oh, well, we need well-being. And there's this over rotation that's happening right now to well-being. Oh, yeah, it's important, but you know what? We need results too. So it's this unique intersection between well-being and high-performance psychology. So the psychology between those two, that overlap of the Venn diagram, are the ones to double down on and get right first. And then we can start to decide, do we, which way do we invest in? More on the high-performance psychology or a little bit further you know, uh, the other direction on well-being, depending on what the unique needs are. But that intersection, that's the fun intersection to work on because you you cannot go far you cannot go high without a strong sturdy base and that yeah. is the unique intersection of high performance and uh, wellness psychology or well-being psychology mm. well and I, and I think the other i know i'm biased and you're probably a bit biased on this one as well but when you think of the three things you can train uh craft body and mind i mean everything kind of starts and stops with the mind i mean you know if you're going to putting together uh, a, a system or something that you want to work on for your body. I mean, it's usually your mind telling you, you know, to do it in, in the first place and same thing with working on your craft. So uh, again, I know I'm biased because this is where I'm working as well, but if you're really going to prioritize something to at least start, uh, I, you know, I want my mind functioning as, as, as best as possible. It's we're afraid of what we can't see oftentimes. And Fair. so we can't see our mind. And so it's not clear how it is that, you know, um, we start because it's all invisible. It's one of the, yeah. I think, more complicated sciences. It's a beautiful science. It sits right at the foundation of being human. And we need each other because you know what? The planet needs us. Um, yeah, let's just stop there. Yeah, you know, yeah, like we fair. need each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to talk about your mind, Mike, because, I mean, you're out there. You've helped so many people across this lovely world, you've spent uh, a lot of time, uh, many years, multiple decades working with uh, incredible humans, but you can only help them as much as, you know, you're performing yourself and your mind, it kind of goes back to that airline example, right? Put on your oxygen mask first before helping others. So I, I'd first love to just, I guess, level set or ground, ground ourselves in what you think being mentally fit is for you personally. I love it. Yeah, I, I don't talk about this part of it very much, but it for me, it is being agile and strong all in the same um, ecosystem. Mm. So strong meaning that I have the agility, not flexibility, but the agility to be able to pivot, adjust, and move forward, to take a step forward. That's what agility is from a physical standpoint. Flexibility is mean as I can get to the range of motion, but agility is I can get to the appropriate range and still keep moving towards the desired target. So I need to be psychological agile. And to do that, there is a strength required. Yeah. There is a mobility, psychological mobility uh, at play. And so how do you develop that? It is, um, it's built on awareness and mm -hmm. then mental skills. Yeah. And so there's two parts of it right? Which is there's the self-discovery part of who am I? Yeah. And then having clarity of those first principles and worldview that make up who you are. And then having the psychological skills underneath of it to be able to be about it when it's hard. It's easy <laughs> to be a curious, open learner, kind person over a glass of wine or a cup of yeah. tea with friends. That is easy. But what about when you're a little tired? What about when there's a looming pressure or deadline or something, or somebody rolls their eyes at you, you know, like who, who are you in those moments? And if you don't have the psychological skills, nor the depth of awareness, nor, nor the, I'm sorry, nor the depth of self-discovery, nor the awareness of, of what's happening to you and 
uh, who you want to be, it becomes very difficult to know mm -hmm. how to be agile. And so it's a long way of saying for me, fitness is um, better summed up for, uh, in, from my lenses around a sense of agility that has a sturdy foundation uh, to work from. Love it. What are some of the, what are some of your non-negotiable practices or rituals, routines that, that allow you to continually train your mind so that when you do end up in those high pressure situations, um, you know, that self-awareness is there. Then obviously you have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tools that you can deploy in those moments. But I mean, first we have to realize that, that, you know, we're at that moment and we're, we've pulled off of the autopilot. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if there's any, um, any practices that, uh, are kind of like a non, non-negotiable. If you're traveling and you're in the hotel room, I I'm doing this before I leave, you know? Yeah. I, I think that, that I want to go back to like, there's an arc to this. Sure. And if we work from first principles, and then and then we move forward then i'll know what it, like if i haven't written down my first principles and i can't explain them to other people before i leave any hotel room that's the do yeah, that yeah that's the clarity piece for sure yeah so but and that takes time that just yeah. takes a lot of time so for me um i'll share a couple practices that are meaningful for me now which might be totally immaterial for you based on where you are and in, in, you know you might be orthogonally different or whatever, but these are the ones that are interesting to me right now Yeah, is that I have uh, a morning routine that yeah. helps me and it's really short. It's like 90 seconds. I'll explain in detail. Um, there is a breathing practice that I've found to be important, but it's not probably what, uh, it's not the zeitgeist stuff that, that is taking place that you be, might be familiar with. Um, meditation is materially important. And then, okay. um, having, conversations that are honest and with Explain people that. yeah and with people that are um truth tellers and like i'm not who i am without my wife sure and so having people in my life daily that i connect with that speak the truth and they say you're full of shit they say mm. yeah that sounds interesting or they say um, yeah, like, hold on, you're missing something here. You know, so, and oftentimes it's, it, it is in this order. These are, this is the foundation for relationships I have support then challenge. Mm -hmm. So support to know and to have each other's back and then challenge each other to be their very best. Yeah. So there's, those earlier practices are that I mentioned, um, the practice I just mentioned earlier, the morning mindset, it's almost like just a refinement experience for me. You know, there's, and there's four parts to it. Uh, there it's a, some one or a few breaths where I just am setting my brain to say, I'm in control. Like you don't need to run the danger gauntlet mm -hmm. right now, like <laughs> yeah. a long couple long exhales, send a signal to the brain. Like, Hey, we're okay. Yeah. Before you check into the news of the world, get to the signal. Okay. So that's yeah. one. The second is a little gratitude work. Yep. And so it's not check the box. I'm grateful for my feet. I'm grateful for my eyes. I'm grateful for my wife. You know, it's not that it is like pick one and embody it, feel it completely mm. as deeply as you possibly can. And then, um, there's a, a little bit of moment to use my imagination, call it an intention, but just seeing myself being a great teammate to others. Sure. And so like, I want to be, a, I want to be a great teammate for, and then seeing that. Yeah. These and are then, your affirmations. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Those are not affirmations. <laughs> right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. And then, uh, the last one is, um, just take a moment to be fully present. So I, where, where I put my feet, I take a beat to have my mind and my body be in the same place and mm. that's it. So that's a kind of a boom, make sure those, those things, cause I'm now specifically targeting parts of my brain to be lit yeah. up in it. And I need, I want those circuitries to be lit up before all the stress alarm bells uh, are taking place. And then the, um, the breath work that I talked about, it's like 10 breaths and I've got a certain cadence I work on. Okay. Um, you know, it's a uh, inhale part, part. Well, I'll just give you the cadence 10, yeah, 10, 20, 10. Yeah. Okay. So inhale for 10, hold for 10, out for 20, hold for 10. So inhale, pause, out, pause, 10, 10, 20, 10. Okay. And then I do that for 10 times. And by like number seven or eight, I am fully standing on the anxiety tripwire. Mm. And so then I get to learn 
um, and practice being with myself under a state of anxiety. And so that's 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 capacity okay. building. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about more about that. I didn't I didn't expect you to say that. I what I wanted to ask you about is in those holds ten times, if you're at that point where, you know, the body's buzzing, and you know you're feeling like the, the, your your body's oxygenated at at this point. Is that is that what you're talking about? Like that's getting closer to this 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 edge of anxiety or is there something else in that i've never done that pattern like what what does that feel like oh it, exactly that like let's say you start with five five ten five right okay. five up ten pause um i'm sorry five up five pause ten exhale five pause it's at the bottom of that exhale and the yeah. duration of the pause that creates it's the oxygen and um, dioxide exchange at some point in a series of 10 mm -hmm. that if you're at the right threshold, five, five, 10, five might not be enough or it might be too much. Mm -hmm. That around breath seven or eight that you're like, ooh, this is what it feels like when I wanna escape. Mm -hmm. All I, your brain is screaming, take a breath. Like you're, you're going to run out of oxygen. This is dangerous. You know, yeah. and all of that fight system, flight, freeze system takes place. And you have to use your mind to override. So it's a top down, you're using a bottom up physiological um, breathing cadence to have an opportunity to do top down work, meaning yeah. psychological work. And the alarm bells are, are, are feelings and emotions that are taking place. And you're using physiology to get to that place purposefully. Yeah. So if you want to be good at, anxiety, which this world is, um, <laughs> will challenge you. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Do it. Well, let's practice that, you know, mm -hmm. let's practice it daily. And so that's one, that's one way of many ways to do that. And then meditation, you know, just sitting my ass on the pillow and, and, um, and doing the honest internal work. And there's two types of meditation. There's single point and there's contemplative. Yeah. And, um, you know, I share all this with you because, I think it's meaningful. That's where I'm the work I'm doing, but it might not be meaningful for for anyone at this point. First principles has usually not been done by most people. Like, yeah. what are your first principles in life? Know that. Yeah. You know, yeah. like know that. And this next from that is what is your personal philosophy? And I I share all this with you, Mark. Like, this is why this is why I wrote the book I wrote, but this is more importantly why I built the course that that I built to to try to move this at scale for folks that are not in a world-class sport organization or not in like a Titan business that are doing this work for their people. Um, that, that, that's available, you know, and maybe, yeah. maybe Mark, maybe what we do is we give one away. Yeah. Let's do, let's you do want it. to do a little fun competition? You know, it's a, it's a $500 Absolutely. course, but we give one away to someone in your community. It's like, oh, I want to do that, <laughs> you know, but absolutely the cash. You're like, let's fire someone up. Yeah. We'll, we'll set that up for sure. We're we'll yeah. set that up for sure. I'll put I'll put the details in the in the show notes with some instructions and we'll we'll get someone in lined up because I, I I mean that's the thing like this stuff is accessible to any of us and I mean it's just there's so much I find there's so much mental torture and suffering that we put ourselves through that not to say you know everyone's different obviously and there's there's traumas and like you said at the top of the show there's there's you know there's real things going out in, going on in the world but there's a lot that we can probably pause release or understand you know why the hell that's coming up and and i think you covered off a lot of the fundamentals i love the idea of principles um and then when it comes to you know your specific uh practices you know everyone listening to this show knows me well enough by now but the idea is not to prescribe you know uh, a, a very specific rigid like you have to do what Mike's doing every day. I mean, that works for you, but there might be something in there. I mean, I'm already interested in trying out that specific sequence of breath because um, it's something I've been doing other breath work sequences, but this sounds really fascinating. Yeah, and if cool. we can at least get one person, right? Like, oh, I can do that. I can try that. Then it's it's one step in the direction of, of being more mentally fit. And we all win when that happens, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. you know, it's amazing. Let me share like a quick little story. Yeah. Um, to try to get the ordering right. Bob Bowman was on the podcast, the Finding Mastery podcast, and he, you might not recognize his name, but he is Michael Phelps coach. Okay. And um, so we're talking about first principles of, of Michael Phelps. 
and we're talking about some practices similar to what you and I are talking about. And he says, you know, being great was so important to Michael that he would, he was uncommon with mental imagery. Mm. Okay. So, so much so that he would do his imagery to see himself like at record pace. And he could, if you put a stopwatch on him, he could, he was so attuned in his mind to what his, the, the exact time he wanted, according to his coach, that you could put a stopwatch on it and it'd be really close because he'd open his yeah. eyes like I just touched. And then the coach would be like, yep, <laughs> damn, <laughs> right on, you know? Like, <laughs> okay. So that's the kind of precision over time that you can, you can have. And downhill skiers report the same thing, you know, yeah. um, ice skaters that I work with at the Olympic level are able to, in their mind, do the routine, um, and kind of open their eyes at the end and be on point with, um, the exact moment that the, the, the thing would end. No. Yeah. So, so anyways, I give that precision, but here's the, here's the takeaway is that he would also, um, he did this, he saw himself, what, how will I respond if I'm almost towards the home stretch and my goggles flip open because they do that and I'm flooded with water and I've got like four strokes left to go. Mm-hmm. So he would spend some amount of time seeing himself and feeling himself in a compromised state and yeah. figuring out how to solve it in that moment. How am I going to think? How am I going to move? How am I going to adjust? And that is something, not just the success, but the compromise state. And that's a really important takeaway when we kind of ladder it back to our early part of the conversation on, on mental imagery is not, it's, this is not all rainbows and butterflies. This is mm-hmm. seeing yourself doing the hard things. And yeah. how do you know what was going to happen? We well, have to be honest with yourself. You know, yeah. and then see that part of you too. So, anyways, um, I share that with you. And if I were to, if I were to suggest a ratio, it'd be 85-15. 85%, right. 85% of the time seeing yourself, I mean, being absolutely flat out, your best, dominant, whatever the word yeah. you know that you use for you at your best. And then that other 15 is like being um an epic a agile problem solver, but you've got to put yourself in that complicated situation or compromised situation. And then the naive person goes, why would I do that? Like, if I see it, it'll happen. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Is not how it works. So no, it's, it's training. It's training for the worst case scenarios, essentially. Yeah. Right? Or it's, it's inviting those in there to find solutions for those. Yeah. You're not training. Yeah. To use your, yes, yes, yes. You said it. You said it. I, I got caught in something you said, but you said it exactly right. Okay. Okay. I feel like I, I think a lot astronauts go through a lot of this, right? Because there's like there's no like they can't. They've got to keep their heart rate at a certain level when they're out there and and whatnot. It's fascinating. Again, though, with all things, it's, it's you know it, the greatest game of all life. You know we can apply this to to our game. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, it's all beneficial, right? It's all beneficial and it's endless, which is fun. Endless in a good way. It is through relationships that we become. First, yeah. that relationship is the one with you, yourself, then the relationship with other people, then the relationship with mother nature. And it's not like a step one, step two. It's like, you know, in the relationship with experiences themselves. Mm. And eventually we're going to need to get right with our relationship with machines because we don't have it right yet, you know, and yeah. they're coming. I, I know you know this, Mark, but in nine years, we're going to have a computer, a machine that's going to be smarter than the smartest human. And so- yeah. You know, if we don't have a right relationship with ourselves <laughs> and our relationship, 50% of marriages fail. So we're, we're struggling there. Our planet is upside down. So our relationship with natural resources is not right. Um, how are we going to get this thing right with machines? And mm-hmm. so that's why the work is materially important. Start with your relationship with yourself and it's an ongoing bit of work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Last question for you, sir. What makes you smile each day? <laughs> Uh, I, I love the question. Thank you. Is um, I think it's a range of things that make me smile. And I, I wish that I could find one right now. But what I'll do is I'll say um, there's, there's little looks in people's eyes, like this brief little exchange with another person that allows, you know, the space to appreciate whatever it is that is true. Like that, that's, those are the ones that I'm like, that's really cool. And so the smiling for me is more of a, um, externalizing of a moment of gratitude. 
And uh, so whatever, whenever I'm connected and there's the space to, to not have to um, be anything other than appreciative in that moment, like that's where I, I feel that naturally awake in me. How beautiful, what a beautiful way to end and, and full circle right back to your mission of helping people tap into the present moment. I mean, I can't think of a better example. <laughs> I mean, thank Mike, you, Mike. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, A, for, for making time to come on the show, but even a higher thank you for showing up and, and, and doing the work that you do in this, this world day in, day out to, you know, foster that ripple effect of, of helping individual minds, the team's minds, and that all ripples down over to, you know, the work that touches us and the relationships that those people have formed and so forth. So it's a, it's a beautiful exponential gift that you're giving a lot of people in this world. So thank you. Felt. Thank you. And Mark, like I got to say, Socrates is like, I love what you've done, you know, (laughs) with your approach there, Socrates and the Socratic method um, has stood up for the, for the, for the years, for the, you know, through the ancient, um, kind of wisdoms for a reason. And so, um, I I really appreciate what you've built. So thank you for that too. Yep. Thank you.